I'm Greg Witcher, and I'm an emergency medicine resident at Texas Tech El Paso. Given the surge of COVID-19 cases here and the tragic effects it has had on our community, I have a particular interest in understanding the vaccine for COVID-19. This video will review the science behind the mRNA vaccine that healthcare workers should know for themselves and for their patients. This video is a summary but I highly recommend you read the review by Dr. Party, who is one of the scientists responsible for the technology that makes this vaccine possible. First, let's start with the basics. What is the vaccine? Given it's the holidays, I'll make this into a simple metaphor. The mRNA vaccine is two essential parts. The delivery vehicle is the lipid nanoparticle. The gift is the mRNA contained within. What are the advantages of an mRNA vaccine? You'll recall that live and attenuated vaccines are not recommended for patients who are immunocompromised. That's because those vaccines rely on an infectious component, that is, the live or attenuated virus. mRNA vaccines, however, are non-infectious. They don't pose the same risk. I want to be clear on this part, so I'll say it again. There is no virus in this vaccine. The next reason mRNA vaccines are safe is that mRNA is non-integrating. This is a really important point because some people have concerns that mRNA of this vaccine will incorporate into our genome and pose a long-term threat. You'll remember from high school biology that according to the central dogma, DNA is transcribed into mRNA and translated into protein. mRNA introduced as a vaccine will take advantage of the translation step, but never be reverse transcribed into DNA, which could theoretically integrate into the genome. There is no retrovirus, and there is no reverse transcriptase enzyme that would do that reaction. Second, the mRNA of the vaccine will not come in contact with DNA at all. That's because it stays in the cytosol and has no way to enter the nucleus. There are two other features of the vaccine are worth mentioning that will explain how it came to be so safe and effective. Normally, naked extracellular RNA will be destroyed by RNase enzymes that are naturally present in our blood. Naked intracellular RNA will be intercepted by toll-like receptors, which are part of the innate immune system. That is a normal evolutionary mechanism that exists to protect against viruses because they too release their DNA or RNA for replication. Fortunately, researchers have found methods to address these problems for the mRNA vaccine. First of all, as mentioned before, the mRNA will be delivered in a lipid nanoparticle. Second, uridines in the mRNA will be modified so that toll-like receptors of the innate immune system do not perceive them as a threat. You might be thinking, okay, there's a lot of basic science behind it, but will it actually work in humans? This vaccine is so new, maybe it works in a petri dish, but it couldn't possibly work in human beings. That brings us to another misconception, that mRNA vaccines are totally new. Yes, the COVID-specific vaccine is new, but the technology it relies upon goes back decades. There's already been published clinical trials in humans of mRNA vaccines for the rabies virus and the influenza virus. I'm going to beef, briefly review these two studies to show you what we already know about mRNA vaccines in humans. First, the clinical trial for a rabies mRNA vaccine was published in 2017. The study was of 101 participants from 2013 to 2016. It was open label, uncontrolled, and a prospective phase one trial. While you might be hesitant about the open label and uncontrolled, nature, the primary endpoint was safety and tolerability. What did they find? In the intramuscular group, 78% of participants had a systemic adverse reaction in the first seven days. Those adverse effects were fever, headache, chills, nausea, myalgias, and arthralgias. Three participants had a serious adverse effect, which consisted of one person with Bell's palsy, one person who had a nasal septal deviation, and one Campylobacter infection. The authors felt these were unlikely to be related to the vaccine itself. Let's briefly look at the influenza mRNA vaccine trial, since it's probably the most applicable study we have to the upcoming COVID vaccine. The trial of an mRNA vaccine for influenza viruses was published in 2019 by Moderna. There were 201 participants, but I will focus on the 145 that were in the intramuscular arm. 
This was a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blinded trial. Two flu viruses with pandemic potential were used in this study. The primary endpoint, again, was safety and tolerability. The immune response was only a secondary endpoint. Again, the adverse effects were divided into two groups, that is, the solicited and the unsolicited. In the solicited group, patients were asked if they had pain or swelling at the injection site, redness, headache, fatigue, myalgias, arthralgias, nausea, or fever. Myalgia, fatigue, and headache are the most common solicited adverse effects in the study. More than 50% in one arm and more than 25% in another arm had these flu-like symptoms. Given this finding in both trials, I think it's likely we will see flu-like side effects in our patients who have the COVID-19 vaccine. Last, there were two serious unsolicited adverse effects that the patients reported on their own. This was one case of cholecystitis and one case of a ruptured ovarian cyst. Again, the authors thought these were probably unrelated to the vaccine. So perhaps you acknowledge the science and recognize that these trials hold promise. However, you're wondering whether that was an effect we would only see in a few hundred patients. Could these vaccines really be scaled up to the millions or more of doses that are needed? Do you remember the Ebola and Zika virus outbreaks? Vaccine technology of that time was not fast enough to respond. However, mRNA vaccines may hold the potential to do so now. Why? mRNA production does not require eggs and it does not require cell culture. Those are the methods of prior vaccines. The reactions that create the vaccine based in mRNA are done in vitro, in other words, in solutions and they don't require the time for cells to grow and divide, only the time for the reactions that create the mRNA to take place. Like I said previously, naked mRNA cannot be injected as a vaccine alone. That's where the lipid nanoparticles come in. Lipid nanoparticles are, as they sound, tiny, non-living structures made of four types of molecule. They can be used to deliver drugs or molecules, like mRNA. They've actually been a huge area of research recently and yet another example of how sophisticated this mRNA vaccine is. I'll focus on one of the four molecules that makes up the LMP. That is the amine lipid. The amine lipid creates a positively charged interior of the LMP. This gives extra stability to the mRNA molecule and it decreases the interaction between the LMP itself and the mRNA, making delivery more successful. As a side note, you may have heard that Moderna does not require the same cooling as the Pfizer vaccine. This is reportedly because their lipid nanoparticle technology is more advanced and more stable. Surely all these scientific details are not relevant to everyday clinical practice, but I included them because they demonstrate how carefully designed this vaccine really is. So finally, that brings us to the science underlying the vaccine's effect. Like other vaccines, mRNA vaccines rely on active immunity. In other words, they create an immune response that mimics what an individual would have after having the actual infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So that means the antigen that is created from the mRNA in the vaccine will be presented to our lymphocytes or white blood cells. While there are multiple cells involved, for the purpose of understanding this vaccine, I'll focus on B cells which respond to the antigen, leading eventually to the production of antibodies that are highly specific for that antigen. Unlike most cells, these B cells do not have rapid turnover. Instead, they last in the body for many years, which brings us to the concept of immunological memory. The final product of this immune response to the COVID vaccine is not only the presence of antibodies circulating in the blood, but also memory B cells, which impart lasting protection because they can respond rapidly with antibody should that antigen ever be encountered again. It follows then that to know how effective the vaccine is, researchers in each trial are checking the amount of antibody created by the vaccine and how that compares to the antibody in a person who actually had COVID. You could also state this as, how does the amount of antibody created by the vaccine compare to convalescent plasma? So in closing, a vaccine that creates comparable antibody to that in people 
who have recovered from the infection would be considered an effective vaccine.